Good morning, folks. Yes, my dear. Thanks very much for coming. Welcome to the Disclosures Tribunal. <laughs> I was actually up at the other room because the venue got changed, and on the door it says the Disclosures Tribunal. So this is not the Disclosures Tribunal. We don't think. Um, <laughs> exactly. So the theme is how can we value ecosystem services from land and river systems. So we have four speakers, three from an academic perspective, three different research clusters from UCD and from Trinity and from NUI Galway, and then a practitioner, that's fair to say, Aileen, Aileen, um, Aileen O'Sullivan. So uh, I'll introduce all together, and then you know each of the speakers can come up in the order that is there. So the first speaker will be Jane Stout, and um, many of you that were here yesterday will have heard she started the tradition of rabble rousing at this conference early yesterday, followed by many great distinguished rabble rousers today. Wasn't that wonderful this morning? It was fantastic. Yeah. So Jane is the chair of the Irish Forum on Natural Capital. She's a professor in Trinity in Botany. She's one of the architects of the Pollinators Plan and has done a lot of work in promoting this conference and the whole idea of what's going on of working together with Parks and My Life. So well done for all that, Jane. Mary Kelly Quinn is from the School of Biology and Environment Sciences in UCD and has been for many years producing wonderful graduates who go on to great things in the EPA and such places all over Ireland and beyond. And uh, Mary will be talking about valuing freshwater ecosystem services insights from a project called ES Manage uh, from a number of people in the UCD uh, school. The third speaker then is Aileen O'Sullivan, who is a forest ecologist working with Kielte, so a practitioner for many years. What did you say, 20 years? In and around. And Kielte has been very active in this whole area of trying to figure out the language, the terminology, the concepts, the praxis of uh, natural capital. And we're very glad that you've been working with you know, other people in this area for the last couple of years. So I'm delighted to have you, Eileen. And the fourth speaker then is from the West. Well, he's a leash man, but he's based in Galway these days in SEMRU, which is the um, socioeconomic marine research unit in uh, NUI Galway. But today, Danny Norton is not talking about marine, actually. He talked about marine yesterday. So today, it's about valuing agricultural catchments. Again, a cluster of people involved in a research project on that. Um, so we're delighted to have all four of you. And the format will be that we'll listen to the four talks first, in the order that they are in the program. And then after that, we hope that there will be a little bit of time. The schedule is a little bit flexible, I think, um, because we're going into uh, space you know, where there will be a short gap and then another uh, session after that. Um, and uh, we, uh, another postdoc, Serla Kavanagh, helped to, to finish out the project at the end. Um, so what we did was we used pollinators and pollination services as a model for exploring methods for valuing uh, natural capital assets and ecosystem services. Uh, now clearly pollinators have uh, a wide range of values. Um, so they have a value in terms of pollination of mar marketable products uh, like crops, but also fuel, uh, fibers, and also nearly 90% of um, wild plant species are, are globally um, benefit from animal pollination. So they contribute non-market benefits to us as well. This contributes to landscape aesthetics, but also contributes to healthy functioning ecosystems. Um, and even though not a large proportion of our crop production currently um, benefits from an animal pollination, it might be important in the future, as with changing climates or changing crop practices, we change the kinds of crops that we grow here in Ireland. 
And even if we don't use pollinators for, for, for crop pollination in the future, just knowing that there's an amazing and diverse and fascinating array of species out there. There's 20,000 different species of bee on the planet, 100 species of bee in Ireland. These are incredible creatures. Just knowing that they're there, the satisfaction for knowing that they exist, that has a value to us. And of course, there may be values and benefits to future generations as well. So all of these values, um, oops, I forgot I had animated that, sorry. Um, all of these values, both direct and indirect use values, um, as well as the non-use values, contribute to the total value of pollinators and pollination services. Um, and we can explore these values using various different methods. And two of the most common methods are to calculate uh, market values, uh, and to evaluate people's preferences. So we tend to use market values to, um, to look at these kind of these use values on the left-hand side here, uh, and these um, preference-based values to, to look at these non-use values on the right-hand side. So in our EPA-funded Polyval project, uh, we set out to look at market and non-market values of pollinators and pollination services in Ireland, um, and the methods there's a range of methods, as I said, so some of the market values can be in terms of goods that are bought and sold on existing conventional markets, um, and in this uh, situation we use uh, price and equate that with value. We know that's not the same thing, but it is used as an equivalent. Um, or we can look at how much it might cost to replace these services um, by uh, manual methods if they were lost, or how much we avoid paying to maintain uh, these services. And then there's the non-market approaches. As I said, we can, this, these involve looking at evaluating preferences, either stated preferences, so asking people's que questions and, and, and noting their responses, or revealed preferences. These are preferences revealed by what people do, the way they behave. It tells us something about the way they value different things. So in, in our project, we used uh, market values uh, and stated preference values um, as examples. So for the market values, we looked at the production and trade of international uh, animal pollinated crops. We took the crop data from the global uh, FAO um, statistics database, 74 different um, global crops which uh, are animal, animal pollinated. And for each crop, we uh, looked at how dependent they were on pollinators. So this dependence ratio is basically the difference in productivity or yield um, when pollinators are present compared to where they're not present, and this reduction in yield um, is the, the dependency ratio. And we also incorporated a, an economic function on price sensitivity of demand. This is price elasticity. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm not sure I can explain it any more fully than that, um, but this figure might make sense to some people in the audience. Um, this is a very simplified approach um, but it's also a very conservative one. So the estimates we get from this are quite conservative. So we calculated that the, the value of animal pollinators to Irish home-produced crops uh, is between 20 and 59 million euro per year during the 10-year period which was examined. The range, this range between 20 and 59 reflects uncertainty around dependency, so this dependence ratio, which can vary with crop variety, it can vary with environmental context, it can vary with other inputs. So we used um, a range of dependencies for each crop, and also we used two different price elasticities, so these, these sensitivity of demand, these, this economic function. But this estimate um, is very similar to the estimate made a decade ago by Craig, who's here in the audience. Um, the big difference in what we did was we then went on to examine how much uh, global pollinator loss would affect the Irish economy um, because we import a lot of animal pollinated crops. So we don't produce very much in terms of animal pollinated crops. Uh, apples would be the, uh, the important um, orchard crops, soft fruits, um, oilseed rape, not massive in terms of the agricultural output of Ireland. But we eat, we consume a huge number of insect uh, animal pollinated crops. So the value of animal pollination to the Irish economy isn't just in what we produce, it's also in what we trade. Um, and so if we take into account the trade uh, in animal pollinated crops, the cost of global pollinator loss increases up to, again, we've got a range of estimates, 
up to 843 million euro per year. So this significantly increases this value, this price um, value associated with pollinators. And if we look at the top five animal pollinated crops uh, in, in, the, in the Irish economy, three of them aren't produced here. So in terms of cocoa, oil, uh, sorry, um, soybeans uh, and coffee, we don't produce those here in Ireland. So our trade is very dependent uh, on these services provided by pollinators. If we scale up to the global scale, so from Ireland, uh, using the same methodology, we scale up, we can estimate that the global value of animal pollination to crop production is between 179 and 468 billion uh, dollars um, per year. Um, and if we look at net trade, so balance of trade, the difference between imports and exports, and we compare this among continents, we can see that Europe over here has a negative balance of trade. So we're deficient in terms of insect pollinated crops. We import more than we export, whereas the Americas, Africa and Oceania um, export. If we model global pollinator loss, all regions have a massive trade deficit. Um, and some regions, I mean, obviously this is, this is uh, largely theoretical because if there was global pollinator loss, there would be no supply to meet the demand. But if we think about this theoretically, um, we'd have this trade deficit of up to $1.26 trillion per year. So when we start to look at these different uh, market values of pollination, they can soon add up. The other thing I think that's interesting in, in, in this scenario is that um, pollinator loss could impact some regions of the world more than others, some countries more than others, and this can contribute to global inequality. So this is also something we need to take into account. So moving away from the market values and thinking about crop pollination, there's much more in terms of the value of pollinators than just crop pollination. And so the second phase of our project was to look at the non-market value, i.e. what do people think, what do they want, what's their preference, and does this tell us anything about how they value pollinators and pollination services? And to do this, we carried out, we used a, a market research company to survey a thousand representative um, adults from across Ireland, so not biased in terms of geography or age or socioeconomic status. Um, and just a couple of, of the, the answers from this survey or the findings from this survey is that more than 80% of people are concerned about the global environment. And this is very heartening. So Irish people care about the global environment. And more than 90% of respondents want to protect bees and the benefits that they provide. So Irish people are very aware, they're concerned about pollinator loss and they clearly value bees and pollination services. And as I said yesterday, this isn't a financial value but it tells us something <laughs> about the value of bees and other pollinators. Um, the other interesting finding was that 68% um, of respondents believe that environmental protection may require funding through taxation. Uh, and so people are supporting conservation and they're willing to pay. And coincidentally, we did another survey um, in collaboration with the Irish Times, um, and uh, most people who responded to this survey supported the idea of tariffs on products that harm pollinators uh, and fines for actions that dam damage pollinators. So people are willing to pay, but they don't want to pay it directly. Um, and another survey that was carried out last year, completely independently by um, iReach Consultancy, found that 75% of people in Ireland were aware that bees were threatened with extinction, and 87% believe they contribute to the economy. And I think all of this together tells us that people understand the threats uh, and are concerned and are um, prepared to do something for conservation. So how much will people pay? Um, another method for assessing uh, the, the value um, uh, to, to people is to ask questions contingent on certain hypothetical scenarios. So, for example, how much would people be willing to pay for flowering landscapes, as shown in the, the picture on the left, compared to if there weren't flowery landscapes, where the pollinators are, are hypothetically gone? And the results from this suggest that people are willing to pay up to €10 Euro per month, um, but we couldn't perform a full willingness to pay analysis on this, but what we're recommending is that this is a methodology that's worth building on in order to inform policy. 
So the total value of pollinators and pollination services should integrate different types of values and different ways of measuring those values. So we can't just think about economic values. We need to take into account socio-cultural values and we need to think about health. And there's been various studies which have looked at the impacts of pollinator loss on the provision of um, uh, micronutrients into people's <laughs> diets and the impacts of that loss on the health uh, of the global population. So we need to integrate all these different measures of value. And that's a challenge. So the challenge or the next step is to try and bring together this holistic framework so that the value of pollinators uh, and as our natural capital and the goods and services that they provide can be accounted for in decision making. So my take home messages are the value of pollinators to the Irish economy could be as high as 900 million euro per year. Um, because we are a consumer nation, we're at risk from pollinator loss overseas. Um, it's not just about crop production, and I think it's, it's easy to take these crop production values um, and, and you know, create a splash in terms of a monetary value and a headline, but it's not just about crop production. There are social and cultural values that need to be considered, and also we've demonstrated that people are concerned and that they are willing to pay for pollinator conservation. So I've just gone slightly over time, so apologies. I'd just like to thank uh, Tom Brees at the University of Reading and Sean Lyons at the ERSI for their input into the project. Thank you. So good morning everybody, I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. <coughs> So this morning I'm going to provide you with some insights into another EPA project that has just recently finished. This is the ES Managed Project which deals with freshwater ecosystem services. And I'm speaking on behalf of a large interdisciplinary team uh, comprising ecologists, freshwater biologists of all sorts, fishery experts, hydrologists and environmental economists as well. Next slide, please. So in particular, what, what I want to emphasize today is how the ecosystem services approach might help support efforts to address serious water quality and biodiverse, biodiversity loss issues. Um, so first of all, to emphasize that fresh waters represent less than 2.3%, I think, of the Earth's surface, yet provide a disproportionately high level of ecosystem services. Freshwater supports life on land, including ourselves and our economies. And these services are provided by biodiversity and the associated ecological processes. However, freshwater systems or ecosystems are becoming increasingly degraded with alarming losses of biodiversity. In fact, as I mentioned yesterday, freshwater biodiversity is declining at a rate that is faster than on land or in the sea. The declines both in water quality and in ecosystem services and freshwater biodiversity are outpacing efforts to address the problem. So here in Ireland, we have serious water quality problems. The recent EPA indicators report indicates continuing decline in water quality. I think somewhere in the region of 265 water bodies have shown a drop in water quality. Furthermore, there has been continuing loss of the high status water bodies. From down now to about 17%. And there is one statement in that report that I would like to read out. It says, the declines seen in our rivers indicators are an early warning signal that trends in water quality may be at a turning point and heading in the wrong direction. This is clearly a wake up call. But that statement lacks one follow-up statement, which I think is important. 
and that is that declines in water quality impacts people and their lives and their economies. And I think the ecosystem services approach bridges that gap. It is described as a way of understanding the complex relationships between nature and humans to support decision making with the aim of reversing the declines that I've just mentioned. So the ecosystem services approach, in, in other words, talking about the benefits and the goods that we derive from nature and that we depend on, pre presents opportunities for us to demonstrate the importance of healthy ecosystems to economies and human well-being. Importantly, from my point of view, it helps to illustrate the links between good water quality and human well-being. And I think that's more easily appreciated than a very abstract w WFD goal of good ecological status. The approach also enables a more comprehensive evaluation of the benefits and costs of measures to improve water quality. It is a framework to better foster stakeholder engagement. In fact, it is described as a stakeholder-led approach. So I want to talk about the ES Manage project. As I said, we've just completed that project and the report will be available hopefully within the next month or so. Um, we set out to harness the knowledge and tools required to embed the ecosystem services approach into policy and practice in Ireland for sustainable management of water resources as required by the Water Framework Directive. So I'm going to take you through the steps. And the reason for taking you through the steps is that there are considerable challenges to doing this exercise to link the, the ecosystem to the services that we derive. So we adopted this eight step methodological framework, which started with identification of the services, then trying to rank their importance, selecting attributes that people might value, and looking at how those ecosystem services would change in response to pollutant inputs and changes in, in land use management. And then finally, looking at how we might value those services. Uh, we based our work on three catchments, the daughter of the Shure and the Moy, the daughter representing uh, an urban catchment, and the Moy and the Shure then agricultural catchments with differences also in the tourist interest in both catchments. So the first step was to identify the ecosystem services provided by fresh waters. And using the Common International Classification of Ecosystem Services framework, commonly known as SISES, we identified the ecosystem services or the goods and benefits that all our freshwater resources provide, rivers, lakes, groundwaters, etc. And then using available data and expert opinion in a number of workshops, we ranked the importance of those based on their spatial skill and the level of benefit from each of them. So we produce tables like this here, and I really don't have time to go into it, but you can see the color coding that we used, ranking the services from high uh, to low. Following that, we took the list of services generated by rivers, and we met with the public in a number of workshops in the different catchments. And in those workshops, we asked the public, how do you use rivers, and what benefits from rivers are important to you. So we essentially got them to rank the ecosystem services. And this is the ranking that was produced. And there are a few interesting points here. First of all, the cultural services come to the top of the list, including habitat for animal and plants and wildlife appreciation or wildlife watching. Way down the list is drinking water, perhaps indicating a disconnect between the tap and the source and something which we have to mend. And also, and not surprising, down quite low on the list are the invisible services, the regulating and maintenance services, such as water purification. After that, we selected a number of services because 
simply we didn't have time or the data to value all of the services. So we selected a number of the key services ranked by both the public and the experts. And these are the services that we, we selected for valuation. So water quality, water health, habitat, wildlife, and angling. And one of the challenges here was to select the attributes that people appreciate. So how do people perceive good or bad water quality? But we also had to have data for those attributes. So this is a major challenge in doing an exercise like this here. So in terms of water quality, we took that visual expression of good or bad water quality, which is the presence or absence of scum and filamentous algae. And in terms of angling, then, it's the number of catchable fish. For wildlife, we selected elements that represented both the um, wildlife that's visible and that which is less visible, so the number of mayfly species and the numbers of dippers, kingfishers, and otters. So the next challenge for us then was to work out how those attributes might change in response to land use management and inputs of different pollutants. So we were concentrating on nutrients and sediment. So using hydrological modeling, we were able to uh, quantify the inputs from different land use scenarios. So under current conditions, which we titled no change, intensification of agriculture, extensification of agriculture, and then interventions such as the use of riparian buffers. So using that modeling then, we were able to quantify the resulting physiochemical conditions in the water body. The next step though, which is perhaps the most challenging of all the steps, was to try and link that to the biodiversity and the ecological processes and then to the services that we were dealing with. So we used what is known as Bayesian Belief Network modeling. And I'm just going to show you the sort of diagram we produced and, and the benefit of using this sort of modeling. Believe it or not, you're not going to see the detail on that but that is a simplified version of what happens in a freshwater system. And I suppose that's one of the challenges, other challenges we had to address, is that you have to simplify it down to the elements that respond to the inputs. So in the yellow there, you have the catchment specifications and you have the land use management. And you can then model what comes into the system so you have the biophysical chemical drivers of change. They illustrate then the ecosystem conditions. And the ecosystem condition then evokes an ecological response in the green. And then that links out directly to the goods and benefits which we derive from water. So it's a very visual representation of the linkages through from the land management to the services we get at the end. This model was developed with the help of expert opinion. So under all of those boxes, there's a whole series of figures that represent the probability of those conditions. So then we were able to indicate how the services might change. So for example, going from, uh, from poor water quality to good water quality could result in a doubling of the number of mayfly species. So the economists then took this information and they generated a series of choice cards. So the approach we used was willingness to pay, at least one of the approaches I'm presenting here is the willingness to pay, and we involved the um, people in each of these catchments in choice experiments, where they were given these choice cards which represented on the far right there no change and various combinations of improvements and 
again, asking them how much they're willing to pay for these improvements. So the workshops were carried out in each of the catchments. The participants were drawn from a range of river user groups. We had on-street river face-to-face -face surveys, and then we had also out-of-catchment um, surveys in Dublin and Galway. So we interviewed over 500 people. And this is one of the tables, the only one that I'm going to present here, because we have used other methods to value other aspects of um, freshwater ecosystem service. But this is an interesting one. So what you're seeing here is the willingness to pay for improved water quality, improved water health, improved wildlife, angling, and so on. First of all, there isn't a huge difference between catchments. But what is interesting is the willingness to pay for improved wildlife is at top, is the highest value. So overall, if you were to aggravate these values across each of the catchments, the value of these improvements would range between 5 and 20 million. The higher range uh, relates to the daughter, where you have a larger population. And then if you were to aggregate those up across the country, you would come up with a value that is not far short of the figures that Jane produced for the pollinator service. So to summarize then, certainly the ecosystem services approach presents clear opportunities to, first of all, reconnect with people to water, conservation of its biodiversity, and protection of water quality, particularly via the cultural services. We're now able to put value on those services. We can incorporate a wider range of benefits into decision making related to water management. And I think this approach could help the local authorities water programs communicate the importance of water quality and biodiversity to well-being and economy and therefore foster better bottom-up engagement. I know some people are put off by the term ecosystem service. Replace it with goods and benefits. Challenges remain. Obviously, it would be nice to be able to couple those models and also to move from land to water to sea and to create decision support systems. So these are follow-on projects that will um, produce these goods. Linking pollutants to impacts on ecosystem services is also particularly challenging because generally we're dealing with a multi-stressor environment and we don't always know how two or three or more pollutants interact to cause an effect on biodiversity and feed through to ecosystem services. We need data. We need to collect data on relevant attributes of ecosystem services. That was probably the most difficult part for us, is get the data that represented the attribute that responded to change in water quality and habitat quality, and yet at the same time meant something to people. However, despite all those limitations, I think we need to initiate the application of the ecosystem services approach. In simple terms, connect pollution an impact on fresh water or indeed any other habitat to impact on people's lives and economies. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. Right. Um, Good morning, everyone. Morning. <laughs> You're awake anyway, that's good to hear. We were all roused into wakefulness, I think, this morning um, by some very good speeches from some uh, fantastic speakers. But um, I'm here today, uh, my talk is probably a little different to uh, the other speeches or uh, you know, talks in this session in that I'm not presenting <coughs> the results of research. Um, but in Creelter, we have done uh, some work on valuation systems uh, and, you know, the financial aspects of nature and biodiversity. So I just want to share with you some of our experiences. Um, 
I mean, I think this is, you know, the, this conference has focused a lot on agriculture and on engagement with people, which is great. Um, if you really were to talk about the natural capital um, aspects of forests and forestry, that, that's a whole other ball game. But what I'm talking about is just a brief glimpse from within the forestry sector, and I'm really delighted to be here to share that with you. Um, how do I change the slides? Grand, okay. Um, Quilta, whom I represent, is the state forestry company, and I just want to introduce you to what Quilta is, uh, who we are. The Quilta estate is a sizable land bank in Ireland. It's about 7% of the national land area. And uh, not all of that is forest land. There's quite a lot of open land on the Quilta estate. But Quilta's forests account for about 50% of the total national forest area. So um, Quilt is a significant player um, in anything to do with forests and forestry. Um, the main business activity is commercial timber production. Um, and you know, we work very hard to improve the efficiency and the efficacy with which we do that. Um, we've also branched out into renewable energy uh, in a number of different forms. Um, we're big into wood processing and more and more now the after use, the use of timber products and the whole um, sort of aspect of the bioeconomy, bioenergy, using timber to help improve uh, carbon efficiencies in the economy. And we are the world's largest, or the world's, sorry, well, think globally, Ireland's largest provider, single provider of outdoor recreation facilities. So, you know, over the years, Quilta has diversified into a very diverse uh, company. But we are also active in nature conservation. And uh, we've been active in nature conservation for about 20 years. But in the last few years, we've kind of redeveloped and re uh, revised, streamlined, reviewed, repackaged our nature conservation work um, using a procedure we developed ourselves called BioClass. Um, some of you may have seen the launch of BioClass last September at an event in Trinity College. Um, the BioClass procedure is really aimed at helping us to streamline, summarize, um, prioritize our nature conservation resource. So uh, it's been a major piece of work in the last few years, and it has enabled us to really kind of reevaluate where we're at with all of this. Um, Okay, coming on to the topic of investing in nature, which is a major topic in this conference, uh, on the Creelty Estate, about a fifth of the estate is mapped for biodiversity, and um, that's, that's a very large number. It's a large area of land. Um, it's also a very uh, diverse resource. There's everything in that 90,000 hectares, from bogs and uplands, open habitats, right through to all sorts of different types of forests. So it's, it's a very diverse resource, it's a significant resource. And as I mentioned to you before, the bioclass approach which we developed in the last few years has really taken a strategic look at that resource and has helped us to kind of summarize and prioritize what we've got. Um, that project ended in 2018, December 2018. And this year we're looking at kind of uh, implementing the outcomes of the bioclass uh, review of our biodiversity areas. So just at a practical level, we'll be selecting a range of biodiversity areas. We'll engage ecologists and foresters to work together to develop management plans for these areas. We've developed management plans in the past, but I think now we're trying to streamline and simplify all our systems so um, that they're easier for us to, to, to manage and, and handle. And we'll be uh, hoping you know, soon to move towards management actions. Again, as I say, we're already managing biodiversity areas, but this is kind of a, a system refresh, trying to improve the efficiencies and uh, the eff efficacy, the effectiveness of what we do. Um, we're also, uh, you know, I think what's exciting about this time around as well is that we've a few new initiatives coming in. Um, one is the bioclass procedure was developed with the mindset of trying to integrate biodiversity management into forest planning. Um, and that's just by using a system of codes, uh, you know, simplifying the ecological information right down to codes and units of information that can be integrated into the forest planning software. Um, and another initiative we will be pursuing 
is developing continuous cover forestry systems in biodiversity areas. So managing uh, biodiversity, managing forests specifically for biodiversity. And there are some very interesting, uh, some very interesting work going on in Europe about incorporating biodiversity assessments into continuous cover forestry management systems and procedures. So we'll be exploring that as well. Um, but to move on, and really what this session and what this, yeah, what this session is about are the economic aspects, I think. You know, the ecosystem services trying to put a valuation on why we do this and, and wh what's it all about. So this next slide is really, you know, based on our experience of the link between, let's say, valuations and finance. Um, in the last 20 years, we have completed some major habitat restoration projects. Um, that amounted to, um, I would say, you know, certainly more than five and a half thousand hectares, close to six thousand hectares of habitat restoration across the estate. Um, and habitat restoration, I suppose, it, it's hard. It's hard graft. It costs a lot of money, and it's hard work. Um, contractors have to get out there and uh, beat back rhododendron. Uh, you know, often you know, using chainsaws. It's dangerous work. It's sweaty work. You've midges eating you. It's 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 not fun. So we try and make sure that the places where we ask and and pay for that to be done are the habitats where we'll get the most biodiversity benefit. So this is what the strategic approach is about. We've looked at our biodiversity resource, we've flagged the areas that we think will give, get the highest biodiversity return for this hard work, and we've invested in the hard work. So based on all that, and we used external funding sources. Um, the LIFE project is a major source of funds. The Millennium Forests, um, the Forest Service Native Woodland Scheme, we've, we've drawn on all those resources in partnership with Woodlands of Ireland and other uh, agencies to, to make this work. Um, and later on, I think you'll see a video of uh, success stories around Ireland. And I'm really delighted to say that two of the Creator Life sites are in that video, uh, Clonbur Forest and um, in, over in Mayo, and uh, Clock Jordan, Scuttleboy, Bog and Tipperary. And it's really, really gratifying to see local communities enjoying and appreciating those sites because after all this hard work and effort, it pays off when you have people saying, I love to come here and hear the birds sing or see bats or whatever it is. Um, but maybe what isn't seen in, in that uh, video is, is the cost behind all that. And that's not what that video is about, that's fine. But I suppose the direct spend on all this nature conservation work was upwards of 20 million euro. Um, and if you look at um, Creelta changing direction on those sites, because there were commercial forests on those sites that were removed, and Creelta, because we said these are very, very important flagship biodiversity sites, took the decision to change direction. So there's another cost that we haven't, uh, I, I haven't quantified for you here today, but certainly we're looking now at quite significant finance inputs required to deliver these benefits. Um, and moving, okay, that's the finance side of it, but when we look at the valuation side of it, we have commissioned valuations <coughs> in the past of recreation, biodiversity, cultural heritage, carbon, uh, using quite similar techniques to what we've heard already by the previous two speakers. And I was involved in the biodiversity valuation. It was back in 2011. And when this in huge figure came out, I was saying, I knew it. I absolutely knew it. Biodiversity is so important. This is fantastic. But you know, then you're in the situation where you're talking to finance people, business people. And you're kind of saying, well, you've made X million from timber last year, and that's cash coming in. This study is telling you there's hundreds of millions of euros here if we go the biodiversity route, but it's very, very difficult for people to follow that route um, wh when the cash isn't there, you know, when, when it's not hard cash. So um, your, your discussion starts to become hypothetical again, and that's, that's not an easy place to be in. Any landowner, any business person will look at the valuations and say, that's fantastic but I still am making money over here. So that, that's where the gap is in my experience. Um, I hope I'm not depressing everybody, <laughs> but these are the realities. Um, okay, so in terms of future directions, I 
listen to what I hear in a conference like this. I've been working in this area for years. We need to ramp up this work. Um, in my previous slide, I've shown you, you know, given you maybe a taste of the effort it took to conserve 5,500 or 6,000 hectares of habitat. It was a massive effort, it cost a lot of money, and it, it, you know, it, it, it's a question of mobilizing resources. At this conference, everybody is saying we need a, a paradigm shift. We need to really ramp this up. Our biodiversity losses now are staggering, and we really need to uh, make more of this type of effort. Well, if that's the case, to my mind, and I agree, these are some of the, 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 the top topics in my uh, eyes. The Quilta estate is a significant biodiversity resource, and hearts and minds are extremely important. Um, and I do think we're further down the road in terms of winning people's hearts and minds than we think. Even in businesses, uh, companies, you know, places where people don't expect to find it, there is a willingness to do this stuff. It's just that the, the structures aren't often there to make it happen. So, um, and I was interested to hear what Ella McSweeney said yesterday about um, people have to be motivated by a feeling of wanting to do it. She used the word love. I, I wouldn't bring that one back to the, the, the discussions with the finance people, but certainly hearts and minds are a huge part. We'll only do this right when we want to do it, and that's the first step. And I do think we're further down the road in that than we think. The second th important thing is the strategic approach. We need to prioritize. There's so much noise, so much going on, so many messages, so many priorities. We just need to calm down <laughs> and prioritize. Have a look at where will we get what we believe is the best value for money from our hard work and our actions. And that's what we were trying to do with the bioclass procedure. But I think this is my top ask. You know, there have been things in this conference where people have said, Vote for your one thing to do for nature, and I think this would be mine. I think we need now to develop structures um, that connect the finance available out there, and I believe it is, with the work we need to do. So having prioritized what we want to do, we need to connect those two. Um, we need to bear in mind scale. Scale is really, really important. We need to be doing this on a large scale, so that means we need large investment. And we also need metrics so that people who invest and who believe what we're saying and who want to do good can see the biodiversity benefits for their investment. Simple metrics are hugely important. Um, it's essential that we build the skills base and the capacity to deliver this work on the ground. We need people out there who understand how to do this work. And foresters are more than willing. They already have um, um, skills that are hugely relevant and more than willing to do it. Um, and finally, um, and I'm sure other people know way more about this than I do, we need to link our habitats with carbon values and make sure that they're fully taken on board in any carbon accounting that we do at a national level. Thank you for your attention. Um, how are you going on? I'll keep going because we're probably short in time. Um, so my name is Daniel Norton from Semeroon NIG and this is some work that I'm undertaking with uh, some, uh, sorry, uh, my colleague Stephen Hines in Semeroon and some colleagues, uh, Edel Doherty as well, and Mary Ryan and Cottle Buckley in Chagask. And it's funded by the Department of Agriculture, uh, Food and the Marine. So it's looking at agricultural, value in agricultural catchments. Um, so I suppose the policy drivers for this is the cap, uh, as a lot of the money, as we've heard before, comes from the EU for farmers. like. So there, the new cap has been uh, presented legislative proposals on the, the post-2020 20, uh, 20 cap. And basically, they want to move towards a more simpler cap, and they also want to have greater subsidiarity, which basically means they want to put back on nation states. Basically, the EU is fed up, I think, that they're getting blamed for everything if there's any problems. And they're putting it, but also they realize that each member state has its own particular circumstances. So they want to pull back on na each country. They also want to focus more on monitoring and results. So basically, you're measuring what is the outcome. So, if you, so they want to basically measure, are they getting value for money in terms of what their objectives are. Um, the main way they're going to hopefully do this is through this CAP strategic plan. So each member state uh, will have to come up with a methodology uh, and how they're directing funding within their own member state towards 
uh, the different objectives. So there's nine objectives uh, currently proposed, and three of these are focused, I suppose, on natural capital. So the first one is climate change mitigation and adaption, and also sustainable energy. We have sustainable development and efficient management of natural resources, such as water, soil, and air. And then the contribution to protection of biodiversity, enhance ecosystem services, and preserve habitats and landscape. So there's a lot there, and then that has to be balanced with the other six objectives, which go from you know, market goods, but also social aspects as well. So again, a lot of these will come in through the cap and through this process, but some of them mightn't uh, be thought of like the EIA or the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, again, we're talking about integrated approaches to um, land, rivers, and the marine. So often what goes in in land comes out in the sea at some stage. So that, that affects elements that mightn't be thought about as agriculture as such. Um, others talked about the water framework, directive, water framework Directive earlier on, the Habitat Directive, the Birds Directive, and the Tourist Sites. And this is, a lot of this is driven by the Paris Agreement in terms of climate change or the Convention on Biodiversity. And these are brought in in European context and through the Bi Biodiversity Strategy 2020, which in Ireland we've translated into our third national biodiversity action plan um, for 2017-21, which and Yvonne was talking about that yesterday evening in terms of her big idea was to implement the plan. So just looking at where agriculture is from a spatial point of view, so our best data on this is about 10 years old because it's done every 10 years based on the census data. So hopefully after 2020, we'll have a better idea. So the blue there is milk, uh, dairy production. The green uh, is beef production. The purple is, uh, purple is sheep production. Um, the kind of orange, which is very small, uh, is arable uh, areas. And then the red is a mixed, where you have a mixed farming system. So this is the each ED. There's about three and a half thousand of these in Ireland. And basically this is based on economic output using standard output. So looking at the change there, you can see we've, over time, we can see that you get more concentration of the different sectors. There's less mixed farming. I'm not talking about mixed farms individual, I'm talking about areas. So each of these is a small area. So each area is getting more concentrated and specialized in its particular type of farming system. Um, particularly, you can see that the red is moving out from 1991 to 2000, 2010. And more than likely, we've seen a big increase in the, in the beef sector, and that's probably going to, with the next census, we'll probably see the blue wave coming through as we see the switch from beef uh, and tillage to dairy uh, after the drop of the quota in 2015. Um, so as part of this, uh, this project is kind of looking at um, maybe we should take a more holistic spatial approach to environmental planning and decision making approach. This was proposed by Daly 2015. So it recognizes that separating land and water policy will, uh, will lead to poorer outcomes for society. So these, those graphs on the side, basically we looked at different catchments um, Sorry, now I should have had a map up the middle. There's 46 EPA catchments that they've reorganized the country into. So basically, the, if you look at uh, measuring the, how agricultural land use and uh, agriculture uh, in terms of animals, the, I suppose the, biodiver the diversity of that, or how heterogeneous it is, um, on a county basis or a, sp uh, or, a, or a catchment basis, we actually have less di diversity on a catchment basis. And what I mean by that is not we're against biodiversity for agriculture, but that basically they're more the same. In a catchment, all the farming systems are more alike than in a county you might have different ones. So if you go to a catchment approach, you can maybe target policy actions towards one group of farmers or type of farming system, uh, uh, rather than if you go on a county basis, which it is in the case, just say for the nitrate directive, is done on a county basis at the moment. Like, So that's so we can show that it, because of this similarity, it might be more targeted approaches at a catchment level and a more integrated approach with what that river system, what the biodiversity within the catchment is, is that. Um, this integrated catchment uh, approach should take into account ecosystem services, uh, geosystem services, social and economic activities, and catch, catchment stakeholder views. So it's not just ecosystem services, but you have to balance off all these other views. Uh, and I talked about how they're more homogeneous. So uh, this is probably, people are fed up with this graph, and the ecosystem services, you're probably well educated at, at this at the moment, we're talking about yesterday, but it is the, the benefit, this is a new definition, so it's not just the benefit in this model or this framework, that it's the contributions that ecosystems make to human well-being, which you can use this framework, and especially in terms of a highly managed ecosystem, the agricultural ecosystems are, um, you can have ecosystem benefits and costs, or ecosystem services and disservices. 
So in this model and in this project, we're looking at ecosystem services and the services that are generated from uh, agricultural catchment. But you can see in our, in our framework, um, there's a lot going on. So we have a lot of uh, ecosystem function processes that feed in. So we've ecosystem services and ecosystem services feeding into the agricultural catchment as well. So you can think of there's a forest on a hill and that's so acting like a soakage for flooding, it's preventing flooding downstream. So a lot of this, if you take it at a catchment level, you can integrate all these different things and look at maybe producing models like uh, that Mary was talking about earlier on. So again, we're using sizes that Mary talked about in her project. Um, so this is just an example of the flexibility of this approach. So you go from, uh, there's three different types of uh, sections. You have provisioning goods, which are tangible goods that you can kind of pick up and hold if you like to think about it in that way. Um, so then you have the regulating services that happen in the background. So like climate, uh, carbon sequestration or uh, uh, basically uh, waste dissemination. And then you have cultural services like recreation or a beautiful view or spiritual values that you try to capture. Um, and then we can break them down to different levels. And again, this goes back to what Mary was saying about data. You often might not have all the data to, uh, to uh, evaluate everything at the class or the class type level. So you might just go to group level and give some indication and show where the data deficiency is as well. So in terms of vision ecosystem services, so this is from 2010. So um, basically we're talking about uh, just over 400, 4 billion euro. And we can see here that uh, in terms of the groupings, I don't think the figures are quite small, but we can see in the blue there, that's basically milk. Uh, and then in terms of our crop output, it's only about 12%. And then the other one is livestock. So when you look at the brown on the, on the livestock, that's beef cattle, and then the pink is the pigs. So you can see that basically a lot of our agriculture is dominated uh, by beef and dairy. So we really are a cattle island as such. Then you can see this as the as the size of it got larger, um, this is the it's figures from 2017. So we've seen that uh, the beef is still quite, or the livestock is still quite big, but we've seen that the crop uh, output is actually decreases the percentage wise where everything has got bigger. Um, the crop has got smaller and the dairy has got bigger. So that is the move. And we can see that later on. So you can see here since 2015, you can see the big jump in the dairy and milk production. And that's due to the quota coming off. We can also see that production is clustered uh, in terms of the largest sectors, and the largest area is the darker green colours of the larger circles, and that's dominated in the east and the south. And none of this is new in terms of production. This has been talked about for years in the west. Um, so they, we can measure them and value each catchment in terms of how much output is producing per year. Then in terms of looking at some of the regulating ecosystem services and disservices, so we can see looking at greenhouse gases, so it's around uh, basically somewhere between around 33 or up, up towards 40%, so basically as uh, other sectors um, pull back during the recession and agriculture uh, increase, especially dairy, the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases is going to go up. So you're talking about 20 million tonnes carbon equivalent. So a lot of that is methane and nitrous oxides, uh, but, and, basically, and some of that is in the figures. Agriculture doesn't capture everything because a lot of the nitrogen load that goes from pastures is captured in the land use. Uh, output. So when you see the actual figures on the CSO and other websites have it, but agriculture is, is slightly larger than what's reported in, that, in those terms. Um, and then look, so that's kind of a disservice. So if you measure 20, to 20 million tons carbon equivalent and we look at the carbon price per ton that we're paying at the moment, so that's projected. Um, Philip Lane, the Governor of Central Bank, did a talk recently on, carb on climate change and how it relates to um, the bank policy uh, in terms of central banking and he was talking about the price they're projected to go up to 80 euro a ton in future years but even at 20 euro a ton uh, and 20 million tons you're talking about 400 million euro so that's about somewhere between for different catchments would vary but you're talking about uh, somewhere between five to nine percent of the value of production uh, is being offset by those values from a from an economic point of view and then we look at some of the uh, we talked about organic farming yesterday and people are saying that it relies, uh, now it's quite small but it is growing, but this is uh, based on some work done by a colleague of mine, Doris Lappel, where she looked at concentrations of organic farming. So you can see there, um, there is some clusters down the southwest and up around Leitrim and also some areas around Limerick there as well, but they aren't showing up just the way the catchments are laid out. And then looking at some cultural ecosystem services. So while biodiversity is an input in terms of a lot of processes that underline, uh, uh, underlie 
uh, other ecosystem services uh, in terms of the sizes, it measures biodiversity as a cultural output because of the variety of the landscape it produces from a, a, an aesthetic view point of view. And people tend to value um, landscapes that are kind of more interesting, where you have a variety of ecosystem types rather than a very similar kind of uh, uh, flat landscape or a landscape where you don't have too much variety or diversity. So people tend to value diversity if it's in uh, basically species or in terms of landscape. Um, so this is what these maps are showing in terms of measuring that. So where is the future? So I suppose this, the biggest influence on Irish agriculture is CAP. Um, that is the reality in terms of the amount of money and people respond to incentives. We've heard that time again. You know what I mean? It's hard to get a lad to believe something else when he's paid to do the opposite. You know what I mean? So it offers a new opportunity because uh, we're only coming into the legislation process now and it's feeding in. This is the policy time. So we also have a, our national policy, Food 2025. So that's looking for a 65% increase in the value of primary production. So some of that will be met through increase in production, but some of that might be met through increases in prices, which doesn't have the same effect in the environment. Um, that differs a little bit from, it, we don't have production targets in this, in this one. In Harvest 2020, there was a hard um, figure of a 50% production in milk and that's been already met around 2017-2018. So that and that there's been a 33% increase in dairy cow numbers, and then in terms of uh, per cow output, it's gone up by 5%. So in terms of more work needed in this area, we need, as I said before, we need to generate more time series of changes so we can see th where the trends are going, and also to model scenarios like how how will different how will different policies affect uh, our agricultural sector. So this may be possible through the use of what's called uh, simulated uh, micro, micro simulation. And we have one in Ireland called SMILE for the agricultural sectors. And through the NFS, which is the Chagas National Farm Survey, they've developed some indicators in Chagas. So by integrating them together, we might be able to model different scenarios and generate time series. So thanks for the Department of Agriculture for funding and thanks for, you for your attention. Thank you very much to Danny and to all our speakers, and I'm sure that has raised a lot of questions. The clock at the back of the hall is not correct, so it's just about five past twelve. We'll go till quarter past, then take a break, a very short break, and I think a lot of people will be staying for the next session, which will be also on similar area payments for ecosystem services and so on in this room. So questions, folks? Yeah. I think that we probably don't need the microphone, actually, so you might as well start talking. Yeah. Sorry. Are oh, you recording? Oh, beg your pardon. So, start again. Beg your pardon. Okay. It's okay. So, would the panel agree with me, and I think many others, that it's no longer good enough to excuse any group of workers or people within our organizations, for example, the finance guys, the sales guys, the marketing guys? It's no longer good enough to excuse those groupings from the environment, economy, ethics uh, circle. And it's. It, and it's shameful to think that we would excuse them. And if we don't excuse them, should we actually think about saying to the finance guys that actually Ireland's society is going to fine you for not producing the ecosystem value that you could have produced? Do you want to give your name, by the way? Uh, sorry, it's Vincent uh, Magland, an environment Vincent, educator. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll just leave it at that, because I think we've got your question. Aileen, you were talking about trying to convince the finance people. Do you want to start trying to um, respond to that? Yeah, I suppose um, I, 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 we are always, I mean, Catherine Farrell mentioned this yesterday as well, including people in the debates is important and trying to include nature in the conversation is of course important. It's not easy. Um, everybody in this room has to pay bills and likes to get paid and it's just difficult sometimes to square all the different uh, aspects of that and to, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. I don't think it's as easy as saying we're going to fine you if you don't listen to us. I, I, I don't think that approach would work myself. I think you've got to bring people with you, listen to different points of view. It's much better to include everybody in the conversation, listen to the different points of view and take a balanced view. We don't know it all. There's a different Anybody perspective. Anybody else want to come in, Mary? Yeah, I, I very much agree with you. I think the starting point is to recognise that there's a range of benefits and that those benefits have value, and that those benefits then are incorporated into the decision making. Thanks very much. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Just hold on, the microphone comes in. 
Can I give us your name, please? Hi, I'm Mike Brennan from the Eastern Midland Regional Assembly. Um, our organisation does a few things, but one of the big things it does is produce large-scale regional plans, which have a big spatial component. And just, Danny, you were talking about how farming seems to be uh, clustered on a catchment basis, so it's inherently spatial. Is there any role, do you think, for local authorities, regional authorities, or even on national level through the Cap Strategic Plan to sp spatially plan farming in Ireland and make decisions on where certain farming activities should be concentrated and then to go to farmers and, and give them that information and suggest that some farming practices are optimally placed in some areas so that they should switch their farming methods? Is that, is that realistic or what do you think? I, I, I don't, I, so basically farmers own the land, they are, they're property owners. So they're going to choose what they're going to do with that land in relation to the market or whatever else coming into that. So there's some people that are going to do beef farming or dairy farming because that's what their fathers did. And that's, but there's people at the margins that can switch. And we've seen that with dairy. There's beef farmers. I see it at home, neighbours of mine, switching from beef to dairy. You know what I mean? Like When the incentives are there, people, not everybody will switch at once, but people at the margins will switch. So you can, if you want to incentivise farmers because they'll react to prices, that they will move when there's incentive there. And that's if you want to do it, and it is back on the government now, they can't go out and say, well, EU policy says this. It will be a national strategic plan, not an EU plan as such. Like. So they will have a lot of, um, I suppose, it will be up to them to how they integrate that and how they direct different incentives in different areas. We've seen through the NITA directive, if you're up in Donegal or Cavan, you have to have a larger slurry tank for your cattle to hold them for longer. You know what I mean? So, Oh, it is done, and we do have a, a regional basis in terms of counties already in agriculture in Ireland, so we can switch. I'm not saying that everything's going to switch overnight or that everything is that. But if you start working at the margins and targeting different options at different areas where there is a need in, uh, for particular goods or services from, from any point of view, then incentives work. So if they direct money or have more, if you get more for your whatever the new gloss scheme is, or you know what I mean, like then individual farmers are change and then they'll bring their land along with them so i think that's how we work it you don't do a, okay everybody in this area has to produce this you know what i mean like it's more about incentives and moving the margins thanks danny there's two questions here on the screen that have come up from the floor so i'm going to ask aileen if she wouldn't mind very briefly trying to first of all read them if you're able to will kill to integrate biodiversity into areas not covered by your by a class approach and secondly has there been a review of land drainage methodologies for reforestation in sensitive catchments. Do you want to try and have a go at just both of those questions? Yeah, um, I suppose the first one there, um, yeah, I, I'm not trying to say that uh, biodiverse, the protection of biodiversity features, if you like, only happens in biodiversity areas. That's not the case. Across the whole estate, biodiversity features are protected wherever they occur. So um, that includes, you know, streams, riparian buffer zones, veteran trees, known sort of nesting sites, things like that, they're, they're protected where we know they occur. So that, that's the first thing. Bioclass was just an effort to point people to sites where they're a bit different than your average uh, production forest. So um, the second question then uh, about, I, I'm actually not, I know that Quilt has been involved in a lot of research in relation to water over the years. A lot of research has gone into that. In fact, Mary's been party to a lot of it. There have been many research projects. Whether specifically they dealt with land drainage methodologies for afforestation, I can't tell you. I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, Mary, you might be able to comment. Uh, on, you know, has there been a review or research on land drainage methodologies? Well, to be fair to say, Aileen, if you don't know about it, the answer is probably no. Oh, there well, hasn't I'd imagine, been a no, formal review. Uh, I would imagine there has been, but I can't tell you the name of the research project here and now. I mean, we have looked at... Uh, forest water interaction yes, sure. so there is a, there's a good body of information of there information. particularly in, in the acid sensitive areas and impact of so what we could say is research place. has been done on this topic mm. as Mary and others have done but whether it has formally led to a review of Keel's practices um, Aileen will check and we'll try and maybe come back mm. on that question so well, if you want to add something definitely afforestation is not um, yeah. afforestation is now being done in the private sector yes, so of course. It's not, you know what I mean? It's, it, that would be a, la a national review. Okay, a national good. review. So another question. We'll just take two more. <coughs> Declan. Yeah, Declan Little here. Um, just um, to feed into the conversation on the ecosystem values themselves, because Aileen mentioned that we should get a handle on carbon 
but uh, my question to the panel generally is that given the amount of work that's been done in forestry and in woodlands over the last 20 years, we have a lot of structures there, we have a lot of mechanisms there to address afforestation and management, and we have a woodland environment fund where companies can actually increase the premium payments of, of uh, landowners when they forest land with, with, with uh, native woodlands. It does, there is 5,000 hectares managed under the schemes and so on, but it does need to be targeted more. And the question I would ask is, in relation to Jane's statement yesterday that we can't put a price tag on nature, but do we need to get a, a better handle on the values of the ecosystem services like water quality, uh, recreation and so on, if we're to sell the whole idea to our financial... Who do you think that question should be addressed? Well, I think both Mary and, and Aileen really should, should okay, address it. Well, we might finish with that, so, because as you can see, people are gathering outside. So, Aileen and Mary, just in response to Declan's question. Sorry, can you just summarise the question again, Declan? How, how much effort should we put into putting a value on the other ecosystem services to be able to, like water quality and riparian buffers and so on? Because Aileen mentioned carbon and there's a strong focus on carbon and there's a lot of work done. It. But there's recreation, there's water quality and so on. If we're going to sell this whole concept, how much work do we need to do in terms of getting those values across to the financial people? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I indicated the level of values associated with a number of cultural services. I think we have to do quite a lot more to um, work on the, um, the water purification services. And there's probably two ways of doing that, and, and that's partly addressed in the report, the ES Manage report, is to look at the additional costs that we have to pay for treatment of water because we have, I suppose, over-polluted water. But the other way is to actually look at and try and estimate what a natural system can capture and, and what is the threshold there. For, for capture of nutrients and, say, other pollutants, and well, to put a value on that. Do you think we need to do more work <coughs> outside of valuing carbon, is what they're say? I think valuations are extremely useful because they raise awareness, and, uh, you know, it, it's fantastic to see that work, and they need to continue, but I suppose my point would be is, in tandem with that, we also need to put in place the practical structures that deliver, you know, for, for known priorities, we, ne we need to get moving, basically. Yeah. Okay. With that, folks, I just want to thank you for your patience. Uh, we've run slightly over time, so apologies to those who are waiting for the next session. We'll take a two-minute break, and then the speakers and so on will come in. And again, thanks to our four speakers today. Thanks very much.